Facts and Truth Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and we're currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you so much for joining with us, all those who are our remote viewers from many locations in, in the country and around the world, and those who are here in person at our house. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much for giving us the honor of your presence so we can study the Word of God together and be edified of soul. Remember that our classes are on Sunday at 10 o'clock and again at 11.15. And after our second service, we have time for fellowship, singing the great hymns of the church. Tonight, of course, Thursday night, we have our study in the book of Ephesians. And of course, after our class this evening, we have our prayer meeting. So if you have prayer requests, praises, thanksgiving, give us a call or drop us a line. Better still come by and join us for our prayer time. And we'll be sure to include your prayer request and or your praise or thanksgiving. Also, my wife Judy has a class on Wednesday for the ladies, and they just finished kind of an overview of the Bible, how we got our Bible, and they're looking at some themes in the book of Revelation. Wow. So uh, she's going to go off into the deep water with her ladies. That's 2 o'clock on Wednesday, if you'd like to join with her at that time. Uh, we have a number of books here on Revelation, so I know she's been deep in all of those books, examining uh, various uh, positions on uh, some of the things that we find in the book of Revelation. So if you'd like to join her, that's Wednesday, right here at our house at 2 o'clock. Again, thank you so much for joining with us. Obviously, uh, we always take time at the beginning of each class for silent prayer. We believe this is necessary so that we can acknowledge any sins that we're aware of to God the Father. We have, of course, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This comes at the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. And of course, we have the enabling or empowering called the filling of the Holy Spirit. We don't lose the indwelling ever, that's permanent, but we can be shut down in terms of the filling or the enabling, the empowering. And that, of course, comes as a result of personal sin. So the Holy Spirit comes to remind us, to convict us, if you will, of personal sins, whether they're mental, verbal, or some type of overt sin, so that we can acknowledge them to the Father and be restored to fellowship, i.e. the enabling or empowering of the Holy Spirit. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study this evening, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you to study your word, to be edified of soul. We thank you so much for your word that lives and abides forever. The entirety of the canon of scripture from Genesis to Revelation, inclusive and exclusive of any other writings. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who provided our so great salvation by his substitutionary atoning death on the cross of Calvary, providing us with everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, and a plethora of other blessings in time, as well as potential rewards forevermore. With these things in mind, as we study this evening, we pray that you'd edify our souls, challenge and motivate us accordingly, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The word of the Lord will be to us, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this evening to the epistle by Paul to the Ephesians. We are in chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10 of chapter 4 are one basic sentence, and therefore we need to look at that in its entirety. We began and actually gone through the exegesis. But in connection with that, we began to look at a study of the underworld, uh, the so-called nether world, that is, uh, in the center of the earth. Uh, this evening's class, as well as previous classes, have developed some of this information. I have at the website several 
things that are available to you that contain the information that we're studying. One, of course, is in the doctrine section. So you can go to Grace and Truth Bible Church and under the doctrine section, under the letter H, you can find Hell and Hades. And we have there a study that is printed out with various verses describing the underworld. And we have just added to the charts and graphs. You can go to the section uh, that is uh, at the top of the home page. It has charts, graphs, maps, outlines. And of course, it has a chart there of the underworld. And if you have that, if you pulled it up, we have it here on the table for those who are present with us. We're going to be looking at that. Now, by the way, this is a subject that this is a subject that a lot of people perhaps have never heard of, never studied, or perhaps never wanted to study. Many pastors don't teach any of these things. So this is our Thursday night Bible study. So we go a little more in depth in many areas on Thursday than other times on Sunday, for example. And so we're going to be looking at some of these things. And again, I discovered a few more passages to connect with some of these uh, that perhaps have been uh, understood, not understood uh, in the past. So we're going to look at some of those. So if you have the doctrine or whatever we want to call it, the study of hell and Hades pulled up somewhere, you can see there that we have basically uh, four names for death. One of them is Sheol, another one is Hades, another one is Kedel, and another one is Mavet. And of course, uh, Sheol, Hades are general terms. Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades, we call it Hades, is the Greek word. It describes the entire underworld. Uh, there is much there, but the general category is called Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades or Hade, the Hebrew or the Greek uh, in the New Testament. The other words, of course, Kadel actually is the resting place of the dead, which would refer to the compartments within Sheol, Hades. For the dead human beings, there are two compartments that are there. One is called torments for unbelievers. All unbelievers of all time go there. And then there's another compartment called paradise or Abraham's bosom, as it's called in the New Testament. This was a place for the Old Testament saints who were believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is now vacant because Jesus Christ descended according to these verses that we have right here in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, into the underworld and made a proclamation there to the fallen angels and to those unbelievers in torments that uh, he had made and won the victory on the cross. So he proclaimed that. So we'll look at a couple of those verses. At any rate, the other word is mavet, uh, and that one has to do with simply the place or the abode of the dead. So again, it is kind of synonymous with Sheol or Hades. Sometimes it's just translated death or the place of the dead or the dead uh, simply using the word dead as a noun describing those people who are dead. Uh, the second point then talks about the compartments. There are basically four compartments that we see in this area known as Sheol or Hades or Hades. We showed it to you last time. Again, I don't have, uh, have it set up so that we can hold this up in the camera all the time. But here's what it looks like. And you can see there that uh, in the bottom of this page, we have four compartments that, according to the scripture, are in the center of the earth. What we have above is, of course, the lake of fire. Some think it's in Sheol, but it says that death and Sheol will be cast into the lake of fire. And therefore, apparently, it's somewhere else, perhaps a black hole in the remotest parts of outer space. We do not know. We simply know it exists, according to Revelation 20, uh, 21. And so we have then two places. One in heaven is called the third heaven, the very place where uh, God himself, God the Father, resides. It's the place where Jesus Christ went after his resurrection and the descension into Sheol to make that victorious proclamation. He ascended into the third heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. So that's the third heaven. Now there's another place, it's called the heavenly Jerusalem, and that, of course, is a, a city that is constructed by Jesus Christ. It says this in John's Gospel in chapter 14, 1 through 3, and other places, as we've noted, in the book of Hebrews. And so it is a heavenly place, but it is a city that's being constructed, perhaps even done by now, constructed by Jesus Christ. This will be the home of the church-age saints 
and eventually of saints of all time. It's the ark, if you will, that will carry the believers into the future, a new heaven and new earth, and it will reside on that new earth in those new heavens, however they're configured. And so this is heaven for us. When we die, we don't go to the third heaven, as far as I know, unless the heavenly Jerusalem is resident there. So I put that as a separate category. Now we've studied that in the past. And then, of course, we have the four compartments uh, in the area of Sheol. We have already discussed several of these. For example, we've noted the one uh, on the bottom, <coughs> bottom left, the bottom left at the top of the bottom left, we see torment. This is the place that all unbelievers go all time. In other words, from the time of uh, uh, pre-flood period all the way to the end of the millennial kingdom, all unbelievers from all time go to torments. Then there's another place below that called Tartarus, only mentioned once, but references made to it a number of places. I think we've noted some of those last time. We'll revisit that a little bit. That's kind of where we left off. This was the place where a particular group of fallen angels that interfered with God's plan by coming into human history and cohabitating with the daughters of men, producing, as it were, a race of giant creatures called the Nephilim. That's described, at least in part, in Genesis chapter 6, 1 and following, 1 through 7 in particular. They are there permanently until the great white throne judgment, and then that likewise, as part of Sheol or Hades, will be thrown into the lake of fire. So that's kind of where we left off. Then to the right of that, at the bottom, we have something called the abyss or the pit. It's interesting that according to Dr. Fruchtenbaum in his study of Revelation, he describes this as some separate compartment. And this is the compartment where demons have been put, but they're not permanently incarcerated. Apparently, God can use them to attack uh, and to do his bidding on earth. As a matter of fact, uh, they're re mentioned in the book of Revelation, as we'll see in several places where it talks about this, uh, this abyss being opened up and scorpion-like creatures. They're not scorpions, they're demons, but they come and attack mankind and are very painful in part of the judgment during the great tribulation of the future. It's also the place where Satan will be cast at the beginning of the millennial kingdom and incarcerated. So we might say it's a temporary holding cell uh, that uh, demons apparently can be accessed or come out. It's even my opinion that uh, the Antichrist demon will actually come out of the abyss, so says Revelation. We're going to look at that passage in just a moment. So the demon that uh, indwells Antichrist will apparently come out of the abyss during the time of the Great Tribulation. So this is kind of a holding cell, the abyss. At the end of the Millennial Kingdom, apparently, Satan will be released from this prison, perhaps even with multiple demons, to once again try to get the world uh, to reject the uh, deity and the messiahship of Jesus Christ at the close of the Millennium. But at that time, God will destroy all of them, all of the unbelievers, by fire. This is described at the end of the book of Revelation. And then, and we'll come back and look at some of these passages. I'm simply uh, going through them briefly. We have the one on the uh, third down on the right-hand side, just above the abyss, is called Paradise or Abraham's Bosom. This is mentioned several places. And also, the word Paradise is also used for a location in heaven, uh, which probably is the third heaven, uh, because it seems that this is the place where the Old Testament saints, when Jesus Christ took them out of paradise or Abraham's bosom, took them to the third heaven, because at that time there was no heavenly Jerusalem. There was no uh, millennial uh, home for the church. It hadn't been constructed because uh, Christ was just being resurrected, going back to prepare that place. As he told his disciples, I go to prepare a place. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go, I'll come again to take you to where I am, that there you may be also. John chapter 14, 1 and following. 
So that's the uh, the heavenly Jerusalem, but it wasn't prepared. So apparently these uh, un, these believers in the Old Testament are carried up to this place in the third heaven, and there's a, apparently a compartment there, maybe not exactly at the right hand of the Father, but somewhere in the third heaven. And as a matter of fact, we see that there is a tabernacle, a literal tabernacle in heaven. Uh, there seems to be an altar there as well, and it says that the uh, tribulation saints who die as martyrs are actually their souls and spirits are under the altar in heaven and so we're going to see some of those passages uh, they're just isolated passages and some people as far as I can see have not connected the dots on these so we're going to try to connect some of the dots from difficult passages as we go along well we look at this section dealing with Tartarus and if you will look over to we'll go start there now, if you have the chart, it's the bottom left, Tartarus. And we see this mentioned only once by name over in 2 Peter. We may have looked at this last time. That's all right. So in 2 Peter, chapter 2. And uh, verse 4. And here it says in 2 Peter, chapter 2 and verse 4. It's talking about evil, and it says, If God did not spare the angels, these would be fallen angels, of course, uh, assumed by the context, when they sinned, but cast them into, now they've located, they've listed there the word hell. This is a misnomer because many times, both in the King James and in the New American Standard as here, they throw hell around for both Sheol, for Hades, uh, for Tormund, for Tartarus, but of course, hell, I believe, is reserved for the lake of fire, so I keep it for that because it seems to indicate the lake of fire, whereas Sheol and Hades and the others, of course, refer to these compartments of Sheol or Hades, and so it is here. So what we find is where that says hell in the New American Standard, uh, there's no reference in the margin, but the word is tartarao. Uh, it is the verb form a tartarato, which means uh, into a tartaros, I'm sorry, uh, which means hell, and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for the judgment. We would see this judgment primarily as the judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom. And so they are incarcerated forever. Now, it could be the judgment at the second advent because it's nonspecific, but I think they are locked up there permanently. Uh, if not so, then they may be able to be some of those who become a part of the cadre that uh, attacked during the tribulation time. But I think those are other demons, and we'll see where they possibly come from. At any rate, it's very clear that some angels, fallen angels, sin. And, of course, we believe that sin was at the time of Noah when they sinned. And, of course, produced that uh, they sinned because they came in and found daughters of men and had this children by them, which were called the Nephilim. We spoke about the word Nephilim coming from the Hebrew verb to fall, nafal. So Nephilim means the fallen ones. I did an entire paper on the Nephilim in seminary, and so I've spent some time dealing with it. They are explained in detail in another book called the Book of Enoch, non-canonical, but it has uh, sheds light, and parts of Enoch are even quoted in the Bible by Jude. Not all of it, of course, so it never became part of the standard canon of Scripture, but it is an interesting read and does describe this intermarriage between the fallen angels and the daughters of men producing this race of so-called Nephilim. Apparently, they were giants, although we mentioned that Adam and, the, and his descendants up to about the flood not only lived hundreds of years, upwards of 900 plus years, Methuselah lived 975, and uh, Adam into the 900s. So apparently not only did they live a long time, but they apparently had more of a height feature than we have today, uh, somewhere between 10 and 30 feet tall, which accounts for the fact that they were able to build some of the mighty structures that we still see, such as perhaps the Great Pyramids. Although people think the Egyptians built them, most likely they were holdovers from the pre-flood civilization. They were high enough, uh, they were not destroyed by the flood like so many others that even to this day are found under various parts 
of the sea, especially along the coastlines. So we have that here. And then, of course, we also see it in Jude, that very short epistle. Uh, he simply mentions this, but it is of interest in Jude, verse 6. Jude, verse 6. And here again, he's talking about angels who did not keep their own domain. Now, their domain was to stay among the angelic realm, but they didn't keep their own domain because apparently they came and infiltrated the human race to destroy the purity of humanity, which, of course, ultimately would lead to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ as being truly human. So uh, Satan and the demons decided to distort the human race, sending fallen angels to cohabitate with the daughters of men. We believe all of these Nephilim were destroyed in the flood, and of course, as all the unbelievers of that time, leaving really Methuselah and the eight that went into the ark, everyone else, of course, perished, and Methuselah died just before the closing of the ark. And so we have here the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. What was their abode? It was in the heavens. Of course, God has the angels involved in the third heaven, apparently outside of time and space. They also reside throughout the universe. That answers the question, are there aliens out there? Everywhere. The angelic realm are all throughout the universe. How many? We have no idea, but obviously they are. However, there is, as far as Revelation, about a third that rejected God's plan. Almost sounds like humanity. I wish it was only a third of humanity that rejected God. I suspect it's higher than that, but trying to put a percentage on it is not easy. But we do have a percentage, about 33, and a third percent of the angels went to rogue and became part of the fallen angel category we also call as demons. And so we see they didn't keep their proper abode, and he has kept in eternal, how long is that? Uh, forever. Eternal bonds of darkness for the judgment of the great day. Another forever up to that great day, which we believe is the great white throne judgment. So we just have a few passages that seem to indicate this, other than the fact that also Jesus, when he came down to take the uh, the believers from the Old Testament out of paradise made a victorious proclamation to those believe, to the unbelievers in torments. I believe he also made that proclamation to those fallen angels in Tartarus and perhaps even to the residents of the temporary cell in the abuse or the abuse, the, <laughs> the abyss. I'm saying it in Hebrew there. Abuse is the Hebrew. The, uh, the abyss uh, because it indicates that Jesus also descended into the abyss. Therefore, he went uh, in his soul and spirit into paradise. He made the victorious proclamation, apparently to those in torment, unbelievers of all time, and to the fallen angels from Genesis 6 in Tartarus, and probably to any uh, fallen angels that were part of the abyss at that time, because it says that he did ascend or descend into Sheol, into compartment abyss, and of course ascended out of all of those. It's because, of course, he is the Lord and he can do that and visit each of those places. He has that, and in, in his soul and spirit after death, he went to all of these places, apparently. All right, we noted the reason that we went to this uh, passage or these various passages is because of our passage in Ephesians chapter 4. So let's go back there and see where we've been so we know why we're doing all this. Mm -hmm. Because the rest of this is information that most people never look at. They probably just skip over these things, but uh, we won't. In verse 9 it says here, I'm backing up, probably picking up verse 8 where we see here the dissension. It says that when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. We see these as the gifts of the Spirit. And they're mentioned severally uh, throughout the New Testament. We have coming up in this section, the pastor, teacher, evangelist, prophets. But they're also the gift of helps and prayer and administration and other gifts mentioned by Paul elsewhere. And then he says, now they put this in kind of a, a parenthetical section. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also descended. 
Now that doesn't mean his ascension uh, and his descension was his first advent coming to earth from heaven, but rather he ascended to heaven, having come down from heaven, but he also descended. And in case they were confused, thinking this was simply his coming down to earth in the first advent, it says descended, uh, he, uh, also descended into the lower parts of the earth which means that the souls and spirits of the unbelievers and at that time of believers in compartment paradise or Abraham's bosom were in the center of the earth. Now people say the center of the earth, that's impossible. It's molten iron. I'm just reading the scripture. I believe the word of God. And if the word of God says he went into the center of the earth and there were souls and spirits in a place called the torments, if there were fallen angels in a place called Tartarus, if there were believers in a place called paradise, I believe it. And by the way, uh, it'd be easy enough to prove that God is wrong, the Bible's wrong. Just go to the center of the earth and prove it. Mm -hmm. No one has ever been able to go to the center of the earth. Uh, they've tried to dig a hole. I think the deepest is they've gotten down, I don't know how many miles, but of course the uh, earth's about, what, eight or 9,000 miles across. So if they got down a few miles into the earth, they're not even close. If they get close, they're going to be burned because there is an iron core. But somewhere in there, beside that molten iron, there are compartments. And some are very hot, of course, Torments and Tartarus, it says that. And there's no light, so it's a different kind of heat than anything that we have by way of fire. It's a dark fire that it gives no light. And then there's some kind of a compartment that's totally air conditioned. I always think of it as Abraham's apartment complex where all the, unbuil un where all the Old Testament saints were housed until the Lord was resurrected. It's now vacant because he picked them up. That's what it says in verse eight. That's what makes this section eight, nine, and 10 so powerful. There's nothing like it anywhere else except a few passages, as we noted here and there. Now, we get over to the uh, area. I wanted to go ahead and uh, finish up with the abyss down here before we get into paradise one last time. Now, the abyss is the location, we believe, of the demons that have been put there temporarily. Uh, we see, for example, I'm in the, on the chart, if you have the chart, the bottom right, called the abyss. It's described in Luke chapter 8. Let's look there. Luke chapter 8, 31. In Luke 8, 31, it says, And they were entreating him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now, this section has to do with a demoniac, uh, and they are mentioned, actually, this episode or one similar is mentioned in all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's not mentioned in John, but it's mentioned in Mark, and it begins in chapter, uh, well, I'm in Luke, so we'll look at that one. Luke chapter 8, and uh, let's see, it begins here. Where does it begin? I didn't mark it. Let's see. Uh, I think it's verse 27. I'll read this one, then we'll cite the other ones. In verse 27, I'm in Luke 8, 27. And when he'd come out of the land, a certain man from the city met him who was possessed with a demon. So we know we're talking demons here. Uh, who, uh, who had not put on any clothing for a long time. The man was kind of crazy because he was demon possessed. And he was not living in a house. He living uh, in a tomb area. And seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said with a loud voice, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? James tells us that the demons believe in God, uh, and of course they shudder. But they do not believe for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they understand what's coming, but they have no salvation based on the work of Christ. And so they know here because they say, You, Jesus, son of the most high God, I beg you, do not torment us. Tormenting means send us to a place of torment. Uh, for, um, for he had been commanding the unclean spirits to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would burst his fetters and be driven by the demons into the deserts. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? Now, the man doesn't answer because he's demon-possessed, and he said, Legion, 
for many demons had entered him. Legion. Now, what is a legion? Well, legion in the context of the time in which we're reading this in the Roman Empire was about 3,000 to 6,000 armed soldiers. So if we can parallel that, that means this individual didn't just have a demon. He had somewhere between three and 6,000. I don't know how they could all crowd into this person. And of course, that's a matter of faith. That's a matter of what the word of God says. He says, we're legion, that's our name, because we are many. Somehow this guy had thousands, at least, of demons possessing him. No wonder he was a crazy person. At any rate, uh, and they were entreating Christ, him, not to command them to depart to the abyss. Now, the abyss, of course, is not torments. That's a separate place. This is the abyss. And I think that this place was the holding cell out of which, later on in Revelation, God will permit certain ones in the guise of scorpions uh, and weird-looking creatures uh, to come out of the abyss. As a matter of fact, in Revelation it says, Antichrist himself comes out of the abyss. Now some people think, well, that means uh, some uh, person has died and is resuscitated and come out of the abyss. Uh, people do not come from the abyss. Demons come from the abyss. Therefore, whoever Antichrist will be he will be demon-possessed. Some think he'll be Satan-possessed. Remember, in the unholy trinity, Satan is the counterfeit God. Antichrist is the counterfeit Christ. And the beast out of the land is the counterfeit prophet. Therefore, the Antichrist is not possessed of Satan, as many think. But there is an individual in the abyss named Abaddon, also known as Apollyon. And he is the king of the demons, who are currently housed in this place called the abyss, that temporary holding. I submit this is the holding cell out from which these attacking demons, taking the form of something like scorpions, yet with the faces of men who come and attack the world and cause them to be terribly painful during the period of the tribulation. This same abyss out of which Antichrist comes, that would be the fallen angel or the demon who will possess the human person we know as the Antichrist, mentioned several times, of course, in the epistles by John. I personally think, this is my thoughts, you don't have to buy it, that Antichrist will be possessed by the king of the demons in the abyss. His name is Abaddon in the Hebrew, Apollyon in the Greek. Abaddon means destruction. Apollyon in the Greek means destroyer. He is the destroyer. He will be the Antichrist. He is called, of course, the destruction in the book of Daniel and the one who will go to destruction, uh, which is his namesake, which will be going back uh, and actually to the lake of fire because the beast goes to the lake of fire before even anyone else. The false prophet and the Antichrist go into the lake of fire at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, and of course, Satan, the fallen angels, uh, those who are in Tartarus, don't go into the lake of fire till the end of the millennium. Now, that's what Revelation teaches. I don't have time to go through all of those passages right now. But this particular episode here, uh, it says that uh, uh, in, in verse 32, now there was a herd of swine feeding there on the mountain. Poor swine, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, the demons basically entreated him to permit them to enter the swine, and he gave them permission. Of course, interestingly enough, swine, if you're familiar, are very intelligent creatures, and they couldn't stand being possessed by demons. So the demons thought this would be a safe place, not to end up in uh, uh, this uh, abyss. However, it didn't work out very well because the pigs were smart enough and they all drowned themselves. So it ended up that these uh, demons would actually end up in the abyss. And that, of course, as a several thousand, maybe three to six thousand that are in this holding cell, maybe out from which Antichrist will come as the head fallen angel, Abaddon or Apollyon, or those the demons in Revelation that uh, look like scorpions, sting like scorpions, yet have the face of men. And so it says that they came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. 
And when those who tended the sh these uh, pigs saw that it had happened, they ran away and reported in the city and, uh, and uh, uh, out in the country. And the people went out to see what had happened and so forth. So we see that this episode is recorded here as well as also in uh, Matthew chapter 8, 28 to 34 and Mark 5, 11 through 13. I wanted. I think one of those has. Uh, let's see. I guess I'm trying to see where the Abaddon. Well, Abaddon. I'll go over to now. Go over to Revelation. Revelation chapter nine. Okay. So I'll give you the, the ones I gave you already. So we had Luke, uh, which was Luke chapter eight thirty one. We noted that. Then it's parallel passage in Mark five eleven through thirteen. The same episode, and again in Matthew eight. 28 to 32, same episodes, not recorded in the Gospel of John, but it is recorded three times, uh, so we have it uh, uh, threefold, this description of these demons that were went into the uh, swine and drowned themselves. All right, then we have this word Abaddon, so go over to, first of all, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. Revelation 9. And verse 1. Now, here we have the trumpet judgments without getting into all of Revelation uh, because we have uh, the seal judgments and then the seventh seal opens. We have seven trumpet judgments and then the, seven trumpet, the seventh trumpet judgment opens to the seven uh, bowl judgments and all of that wrath occurs towards the end of the tribulation. But the trumpets, of course, are mentioned here. This is the fifth trumpet, and the fifth trumpet, five, six, and seven, are called the three woes. So the first woe of three woes are the last three trumpets. So in this chapter 9 of Revelation, it says the fifth angel. This was the fifth angel, and the fifth trumpet, the first woe sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven that had fallen to the earth, and the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. Now, again, many people think that this is Satan. No one knows because it doesn't say Satan. But obviously, it is an angel. Could be a fallen angel. It could be actually uh, this individual uh, that we're calling Apollyon or uh, 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 Abaddon. So we'll see. At any rate, it says he opened the bottomless pit. Now, in the Greek, the word here is abyss or abyss. So this is the abyss, the compartment we're talking about. And so he opened it up, and smoke like a furnace came out, and uh, the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth. The power was given to them as if they were scorpions of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, uh, of course, locusts eat up the grass, you see. So these are different kind of locusts. They come out of the abyss. I submit that this is simply a metaphor for the demons that were incarcerated there. Perhaps the ones, the 6,000 that went uh, into the swine and ended up in the abyss. That's the only other place they could come from that is recorded. Doesn't mean it's the only place, but that was recorded that they were there. So perhaps of the 6,000, these are some of those. And uh, it says, nor anything, none, none of the trees, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. And it will, they will long for to die, but death will flee from them. And the appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle on their heads, as it were, Stephanos. These are victor's wreaths, as if they were uh, victorious, like gold. It's not saying that they were gold. It's not saying that they were uh, crowns of any kind. It says they were like it. And so uh, their faces were like the faces of men. Therefore, I submit they're not really locusts. Uh, and they're not really scorpions. These are fallen angels from the abyss that are being released from that temporary holding place. Remember I said Satan at the second advent will be cast here and then released at the end of the thousand years for a short time to attempt to deceive the world. 
So this is not the place called Tartarus. That's sealed up permanently, but rather a holding cell. Now, I get this, of course, from the scripture and also colleagues like Dr. Uh, Fruchtenbaum, who teaches this as well, and uh, uh, other scholars as well. By the way, some of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Henry Ironside of many, many years ago, uh, also teaches these same things. So this is not something new, but it's something that's not taught very often these days. And their faces were like the faces of men, and that hair like the hair of a woman. And their teeth were like the teeth of uh, lions. And their breastplate like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and many horses rushing to battle. Here's where people think, well, these are tanks and military armaments. I think these are demons. This is not military uh, armament that has been produced by men. They came out of the abyss. Now, out of the abyss, you don't have tanks and artillery. You have fallen angels. <clears throat> and they have tails like scorpions that sting. And in their tails, there's the power to hurt men for five months. Here's the caveat, verse 11. And they have a king over them, the angel, fallen angel, of the abyss. Perhaps the one who had the key to the abyss and went down that we noted in the first chapter. They have a king over them. And his name, of course, in Hebrew is Abaddon. Abaddon meaning destruction. And in the Greek, his name is Apollyon. It means destroyer. Uh, we always think that this is Satan, but apparently this is a very high-ranking fallen angel. He is the head angel, if you will, the king in the abyss. He apparently, in my opinion, would fit the bill for Antichrist. Uh, that is to say, not Antichrist, but the demon who possesses Antichrist, who comes up out of the pit. Now, the beast of Revelation has two meanings. One is the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire uh, allows for the activity of the beast, but it's also the person of the Antichrist, I believe, possessed by Abaddon or Apollyon here. Now, that's all the information we have, but I thought it would be interesting to see it. So that's Revelation 9.1, particularly verse 2 and 11. And then we go over to Revelation 11. Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony. These are the two witnesses during the tribulation of the future. If you don't know what the tribulation of the future is, I don't have time to develop it now. After the church is raptured, there's at least a seven-year period known as the tribulation, the last three and a half years known as the great tribulation. And it says here, when these two witnesses who were giving their testimony, I believe, at the beginning, uh, uh, or towards the middle of that tribulation time, when they had finished their testimony about Jesus Christ, it says, uh, the beast, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. I believe this is Abaddon and Apollyon coming out of that holding cell, and he brings with him these demons, that are going to look like scorpions and uh, uh, like horses and all of those things of Revelation 9. So we just have it sketchy information, but I'm putting pieces together here. Hopefully it's instructive for you. Then go over to um, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 17. I realize that some of these people say, I never heard any of this. I don't doubt it. I, uh, very few pastors teach these things. They're lucky if they get the gospel straight, let alone in-depth Bible teaching about uh, hell and Hades and all of those. Chapter 17, verse 8. In verse 8 it says, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up, where? Out of the abyss. Not out of torments, not out of Tartarus. He comes out of Sheol, Hades, but the compartment's called the abyss. Again, my candidate is a demon named Apollyon in the Greek or Abaddon. Abaddon in the Hebrew, destruction. Apollyon in the Greek, the destroyer. He comes up out of the abyss and goes to destruction. Well, people say, well, maybe it's some individual that he's possessing who in combat has a mortal head wound and then is healed of that. That certainly is possible, but it also refers to, that is the beast, to the Roman Empire that was not, as they say here, uh, it, uh, it is not, 
that it was and is not and is about to come. That is to say that the Roman Empire that will be headed up, that is the revived Roman Empire and all that it will entail according to Revelation uh, during that tribulation, uh, it says uh, it was, it is not. Of course, at the time of his writing, it was going to be, uh, but it will be again. And so whether it's the individual that suffered the head wound or it's referring to Rome, we do not know. The scholars argue about it all the time. I'm not going to do it. I'm simply telling you that the demon that will be uh, possessing the individual we know as Antichrist is coming out of the abyss, and I think that's Apollyon. And then, of course, we have Revelation chapter 20, 1 and 3. Revelation 21 chapter 20, 1 and 3. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. Now here again, it seems that this is an elect angel, whereas on the other passage, it may or may not have been an elect angel. We can't be certain of that. And it says he laid hold of the dragon. If you don't know who that is, it's the serpent of old. Who is the devil? Okay, who's the devil? And Satan, and bound him up for the thousand years, and threw him into the abyss temporarily till the end of the thousand years and shut it and sealed it over him that is nothing operational no operational demons no satan during the millennium it'll be a period of a thousand years without satan without demons and only men's old sin nature to cause them to reject jesus christ uh, kind of like the perfect environment in the garden of eden and of course satan spoiled that uh, by tempting Eve, but they had perfect environment up to then. Perfect environment will happen again without Satan, without demons, and yet men will resist up to the point at the end where Satan will once again be released to see if he can deceive the nations at the end of the millennium, released for a short period, just as he deceived Eve. And so it says here, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until until the thousand years were completed. After these things, thousand year millennial kingdom, he must be released for a short time. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them. And then he goes on to other things, speaking about uh, the reign of a thousand years of Jesus Christ. And of course, those who will reign with him during this time as well. Well, that brings us through this section here. Uh, and I think that's the abyss. Now, I wanted to get on to the paradise again. We've mentioned it, but uh, I'm going to come back because I have some new verses that I want to add there, and time will not allow today. So, stay tuned for next Thursday because we're going to look at some additional Old Testament passages. If you're interested, you might look over at Proverbs 15:11, and you might look at Isaiah 61:1 in connection with our passage, Isaiah 61, 1, and Proverbs 15, 11, in addition to what we have in that circle, which is on the right, the second up from the bottom, paradise or Abraham's bosom. In addition to what's there, we have Proverbs 15, 11, and also Isaiah 61, 1. More about that, pardon me, next time. Father God, thank you again for this opportunity to study these rather difficult things, areas that are not often covered and taught in local churches. Nevertheless, it is my job as a pastor to communicate every jot, every tittle, every word, every concept, every chapter, every subject, every person in your scripture. And therefore, I do my due diligence to provide the understanding as best I have through the filling of the Holy Spirit to know those things and to teach them to the congregation so that they are without excuse and they understand the destiny of the unsaved, of the fallen angels, as well as our destiny, which is to be with your son, Jesus Christ, forevermore, simply by believing in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. If you're here right now this evening without Christ, without hope and without eternal life, we want you to know God had a plan for you. He sent his second member of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, true, hum true uh, undiminished deity, pardon me, perfect God and true humanity through the virgin birth. We could explain that in great detail, but the virgin birth indicates that he was born without a sin nature, never acquired one, never committed any personal sins in his entire life, therefore became that spotless, 
sacrifice, as John called him, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The only way that he could take away the sin of the world was to be sinless and spotless, like the representative offerings of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Covenant. And he did that. He died on the cross, bore the sin of the entire human race once and for all time, once and for all people, and once and for all sins. And right now, right where you sit, in the privacy of your soul, you can believe in Jesus Christ. That's the moment of your eternal salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely called, his uniquely chosen, his uniquely born of the virgin son in human history, that whosoever, anybody, if that's you, put your name in there. Who believes in him. Believes what? Believes that Jesus Christ is God, undiminished deity, true humanity, and that he is the savior of all of us and died for our sins. If you believe that, you will not perish. That is, be separated from God and go into eternal darkness, into a place called torments, to be later cast into the lake of fire, a place you do not want to go. But it's all for you to escape that simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John said it's written that you may believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you may know beyond any doubt that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for the study that we've had before us, rather difficult though it is, pray that your Holy Spirit will encourage and lift us up, challenge us to witness to our unsaved friends, lest they end up in some of these horrible places, torments, and later the lake of fire, so that instead they might join us in that heavenly Jerusalem and share in the banquet of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Help us to do that, Father, for we pray these things in the mighty and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.